The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we are 13 years into this podcast. Six of those years we have dedicated one month or another throughout the all those years to talking about the debt trap, the Chinese debt trap. <laughs> it's a story that simply will not go away. Longtime listeners of the program will know that we ourselves have not debunked it. We have relied on the research of scholars and experts around the world for the past six or seven years, ever since Indian pundit Brahma Chalani came out with that in a Project Syndicate article. Well, it has shown a life of its own. And I want to bring this up today because there was a fascinating report that came out this week from Boston University and the Global Development Policy Center there. And this is a report, and let me just read you the title of it, Demystifying Chinese Overseas Lending and Development Finance, Why China Became the World's Largest Official Bilateral Lender. It was written by our good friends there, Torella Moses, Cecilia Hunt Springer, and Kevin Gallagher. Kevin, by the way, who we just had on the show on our Tuesday program talking about Chinese debt. So they came out with this new report, and a big chunk of the report is dedicated to, guess what, the debt trap. And you're thinking to yourself, why in God's name are we seeing this yet again? I mean, how many times do prominent research institutions like Boston University Johns Hopkins, Chatham House in London, have to publish these types of reports that debunk the debt trap. And yet, here it is. Let me explain to you why, because there is an odd culture in Washington. And that culture in Washington says that the sky is blue, clouds are white, ice cream tastes great, and the Chinese engage in predatory lending. And if you want to hear what that sounds like, let me just play a little bit of an exchange between General Michael Langley, who's the commander of U.S. forces in Africa, and Senator Angus King, who is on the Senate Armed Services Committee and was questioning General Langley during the general's first appearance before the Senate Armed Services Committee in his new role as head of Africa. Remember, he took over for General Stephen Townsend last year. And there was a little bit of a hope that when General Langley came in, he would not continue some of the same narratives that General Townsend did. That is apparently not the case. So let me just kind of give you this sample, and then that's going to contextualize why the folks at Boston University felt the need to write this report. China has sort of scaled back on on Belt and Road to some extent, and and some of the debt uh, issues are now coming to the fore. Uh, are there are there countries in Africa starting to rethink some of those commitments? Uh, buyer's remorse is probably the best term. Senator, uh, uh, great question, and and I I traverse for that uh, for any indicators of that, and I uh, lo and behold, I saw a story this morning out of Kenya. Uh, they've taken to the streets uh, of how China has been taking advantage of them in the deals that they strike. Uh, there's other indicators across the continent, other stories of uh, debt trap uh, diplomacy. Uh, that uh, I call it, it debt it, colonialism. Uh, oh yeah, abs- absolutely, Senator. Well, so l- let me follow up. If that's the case, and it appears that it is, does this create an opening for us to be more active in uh, infrastructure projects, uh, support for uh, for development in these countries, that that we can come in and show that it can be done uh, in a much more uh, uh, efficient and and uh, skilled way. Uh, absolutely, Senator, that we do have that. We see that as an opportunity. Cobus, there is so much that is wrong 
with what the general is saying. Let me just first clear the air on those reports about the protests that he was talking about in Kenya. Do you remember those were the China Square Mall protests where traders came out to protest the presence of low-cost imports, many of which, by the way, were bringing in by Kenyan traders themselves. That was not about yeah, the deals. Yeah, that's nothing to do with debt Nothing to do with yeah. debt at all. Nothing to do with the deals, completely out of context. And then for the general to accept the premise that not only is it debt traps, but it is debt colonialism, really starts to speak to the poor quality of information that his briefers are giving him, that is staff. This is now going beyond the principles. The senator's staff, the general staff, can't even do a Google search on this issue. Because if they did a Google search on this issue, and you can kind of see my frustration here, they would find New York Times columns from Deborah Braudigam, you know, the Atlantic magazine, where literally Professor Braudigam says there is no Chinese debt trap. They would find Chatham House. They would find the work of Matt Furchin. They would find the work of so many scholars. The laziness of what's going on here is pathetic. And here's the issue. And again, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I am saying. I am not saying this to defend Chinese lending. I am not saying this to defend the Chinese. Let them defend themselves. I'm saying this to show that the shortcomings in the United States' understanding of this issue is causing real harm to the United States. And they're increasingly isolated from their allies and from African partners on this. We heard when Kamala Harris, the vice president, was in Africa how one president after another was pushing back and saying, enough. Remember in Ghana, they said, you have an obsession with this. And how poorly informed these senior level U.S. stakeholders are on this issue has to then raise credibility questions as to what else they know. You have now taken this even one step farther, where you've even said, we're six years into this, a Google search on China debt trap Africa would bring up all sorts of debunking things from credible institutions that these organizations would trust. Again, Johns Hopkins, Boston University, Chatham House. We can go down the list of people who've done this. This is not some pro-CCP think tank that, you know, is, is, is trying to put propaganda out. And so you've said because the information is so readily available, now it's morphing into moving away from ignorance into outright disinformation. Yes, that is how I tend to look at it. I don't think these people are not informed. I know that kind of groupthink is prevalent in Washington, but also no one has more access to information than these leaders. No one. I got to tell you, you say that, but at the end of the day, you cannot overstate how poorly informed so their worldviews are. I mean, it is shocking. I mean, they are so sincere in their belief on this. They really are. They apparently can't do a Google search, but they are sincere in believing this. Yes, but here's another kind of like, you know, kind of, I think, notable percentage, you know, that 2000 to 2021, uh, I recently saw that the share of private lending, which is almost completely held by Western companies, particularly in New York, in London, and in Frankfurt, increased as a percentage of African debt in 2000, it was 6%. And by 2020, 2021, it was a quarter of Africa's total external debt. So, and th that financial industry obviously is very big contributors to both the Democratic and Republican Party. They are very, very valuable kind of like partners in general. And the, and the one thing that both the Republicans and the Democrats want to avoid is to pick a fight with their own financial industry. I think that's where a lot of this lies. That plus, of course, you know, kind of like scoring any kind of points against China, you know, is just, just the way to go in Washington at the moment. So, yeah, I do think it's disinformation. And I don't think that these people actually believe what they're saying. You know, I think it's just, it's a Veep style kind of like talk talking point that has taken on a, a life of its own. I think they do believe what they're saying, as misguided and misinformed as it is. I think they're absolutely 100% sincere. I think the general really genuinely thinks this. Again, I still for the life of me don't understand why a general who oversees a military command is being asked to comment on debt and finance and economic issues. Literally, this is the only country in the world that asks its general to do that kind of thing. The whole thing is, is a little bit absurd, but let me just go through what BU said, and they laid it out in really, really clear points. I mean, they made it so that there is no way to misunderstand that there is no Chinese debt trap in Africa or elsewhere. 
And again, this is from the BU. So they gave three reasons. They said, number one, the narrative ignores that Chinese finance projects are driven in part by recipient country demand and countries knowingly choose loan finance from Chinese banks for their development projects. Okay? So imagine that you are an African policymaker and you're listening to this exchange that just happened between General Langley and Senator Angus. And you're thinking to yourself, they think we're stupid. That's the only takeaway you can get, that we don't know any better and we had we were hoodwinked by the Chinese. Number two, here's the second point. By removing recipient country agency, by assuming recipient countries do not hold close control over their public assets and would willingly give them up, the narrative perpetuates the idea that recipient countries are victims of Chinese economic statecraft. It assumes recipient countries have no leverage or know how to negotiate these deals with China or independently make decisions about aligning with China on different policy areas. Interestingly, this number two point, I do believe that a lot of folks think that of African countries, that they don't know what they're doing with the Chinese, and the Chinese are way more sophisticated, and they're, again, they're hoodwinking them. That's my, I, you know, I think that. Number three, and this is the final point. The narrative ignores the fact that Chinese financiers, like global financiers, emphasize making profits and seek to avoid non-repayment. This is evident in many of the debt negotiations where Chinese lending institutions have preferred to defer debt payments or restructured debts. What do you take away from those three points from the BU report? I think they're very solid. I think they, you know, kind of they, that is exactly the problem. I would add another one to that, which is that... Obviously, in pretending that uh, the entire debt problem is only a Chinese problem and pretending that, as Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., famously said that, you know, kind of we helped all of these poor countries with a highly indebted poor country initiative of the mid-2000s, and then China went and re-indebted them. You know, kind of that whole narrative, that whole talking point, shows a complete refusal to engage with the really massive kind of elephant in the room, which is that international financing is broken and that Africa doesn't get nearly the amount of financing you know that it needs for infrastructure building because it's being unfairly treated in the international financial system which you know kind of like generations of african economists have pointed this out and what it then the message it then sends is because we're putting in this kind of fake talking point instead of the real because we're addressing this fake problem instead of the actual real problem that's actually holding back development in Africa that is code for we don't care <laughs> that the system is broken we don't care that you find it impossible to build the infrastructure you need we don't care right so despite all of the visits from Kamala Harris and colleagues and upcoming visits from President Biden to Africa it all means nothing because they fundamentally refuse to engage with the real core issue that is plaguing African policymakers, which, you know, I, you know, either way, I don't particularly care one way or the other, like how effective US messaging is in Africa. But what it really strikes me is, like, is wow, if you wanted to leave an opening for Chinese messaging, this is it. You know, kind of this is this. Is, if you want to promote Chinese messaging on the continent, this is the way to do it. What's interesting is that you don't see other U.S. allies actually following through, and that should be another indication to U.S. stakeholders that they're on a dead end with this messaging, that the Brits, who the foreign secretary just outlined a new China strategy, is deviating a lot from the United States. We saw President Emmanuel Macron return from China again with a very different vision for France's policy with China. Israel, in many ways, has embarked on a strategic autonomy strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, again, not fully aligning with the United States and Germany as well. And I think that this really starts to show that the United States is going to become increasingly isolated, even among its allies, if it continues with these kind of narratives that, again, are just not backed by a simple Google search. So if you're on the staffs of these people who are testifying before Congress, shame on you. Shame. Really. <laughs> for not doing an effing Google search just to challenge some of these narratives. And again, the point is that if you're putting bad information out there, you're undermining your credibility. And that's that's the big, I mean, I just, okay. I was so frustrated this week writing this. Like, here we have, you know, these researchers at Boston University who have a lot to do and we're wasting time and cycles to go back over the same thing over and over and over again. And again, I understand why they do it, because the need is still there to do it. And, you know, apparently it's still there to do it. But what a waste of effort and time. 
when there's already been so much great research out there that's doing that. Let's quickly bring you up to date on some other news before we get to our discussion today. The World Bank's chief economist, Dermot Gill, told Reuters some very interesting information about this supposed breakthrough that occurred at the World Bank IMF spring meetings that took place earlier this month in Washington, D.C., where apparently there was some kind of consensus reached between the Chinese and the MDBs over this question of will the Chinese insist that the MDBs take haircuts on their loans, losses on their loans to the world's poorest countries. In Dermot Gill, who again is the chief economist at the World Bank, he kind of said, you know what, you don't want to take that one to the bank, no pun intended, because the Chinese may not have seen that as a binding agreement, given the fact that the talks were largely in an informal setting and not in a kind of more formal mechanism. So we may not have made the kind of progress that we thought. These comments now came out after we had spoken to our two guests. And again, we're going to continue our conversation today on debt. We started it earlier with Kevin Gallagher from the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, the same Kevin Gallagher who co-authored this report we just mentioned. And so we're going to pick it up today with the same question of what's going on? Where are we right now? And Lord, I hope that people on the Senate Armed Services staff are listening to the show. I hope that AFRICOM's advisors to General Langley are listening to this show to give them the kind of insights that they need because they need to hear from the experts we're talking to in order to give them more refined understanding of these critical issues. So today we're going to be bringing you a discussion with Ishak Diwan, who's the research director of the Finance for Development Lab at the Paris School of Economics and also Shang Jingwei, who is the N.T. Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy at Columbia University and also a Professor of Finance and Economics at the Columbia Business School and the School of International Public Affairs. And he's also the former Chief Economist at the Asian Development Bank. So once again, we want to bring the questions to them. Where are we in the China global debt and specifically focused on Africa so let's tune into our discussion now with Ishak Diwan and Shan Jingwei. Ishak Diwan, Shan Jingwei, thank you both for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. Glad for us to join. Thank you for hosting us. Ishak, let's start our conversation with you. It's been a couple of weeks now since the IMF World Bank spring meetings. There was talk of a lot of breakthroughs that happened at these events. We're still struggling to kind of take into account what happened there. What are the announcements? What are the big takeaways? At the same time, we're seeing appeals from developing countries like Zambia saying, help, we need to take action now. We're not seeing it, even though, again, there was a lot of positive momentum coming out of those spring meetings. Tell us from your perspective, where are we right now in this issue of debt and developing countries? Right. It's difficult to evaluate that there was this round table on debt uh, last Thursday in Washington, actually. And there was a discussion there between uh, the World Bank and China, and the debtors was there. It's not very clear what came out of that. I mean, you hear different things from different people. But uh, basically, the Chinese came in asking for the MDBs to take a haircut. And the MDBs came up with a defense, uh, you know, explaining that uh, especially IDA loans were highly concessional. Uh, that there were lots of grants as well, uh, and that taking a cut would actually, you know, end up hurting the credit ratings and and their future flows. And it seems that the Chinese conceded and demanded instead that the flows be increased in the future above what they would happen normally, and that they would have an even grand, larger grant equivalent, you know, as a way to reduce the haircut. On Chinese loans. Now, supposedly, Ida conceded to what extent and offered to uh, disburse in the form of grants in Zambia for the next few years. You know, so far, Zambia being what they call a bland country was getting highly concessional loans. And from what I understand, it's other MDBs uh, that, that protested and, and thought that this would not necessarily be a solution that works for them. So that's on the specifics. You know, we can come back on the bigger picture. 
Shangjin, over the last while, we've seen officials like, for example, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen being quite critical about China's position in relation to debt renegotiation, but not being very particularly kind of not not particularly kind of cluing anyone in about what the internal realities are within China that is forcing some of these tendencies, like, for example, insisting on debt rescheduling rather than debt cancellation. So I was wondering if you could like give us a little bit of a background in what are some of the factors that we should take into account on the Chinese side that is complicating their kind of participation in debt renegotiations. Right. So let's think about uh, some of the big pictures. So what we want for indebted uh, uh, developing countries are essentially two things. One is to find an effective way to reduce the present value of their stock of debt. So to address uh, what's called the debt overhang problem, so that uh, you know firms, uh, entrepreneurs there will have incentive to continue to invest and, and produce. And we, what we also want uh, is new flow of uh, financing to those countries. So however you do it, these are the kind of the goals we want to have. Now, from a creditor side, uh, both the Chin- uh, Chinese as a creditor, Western uh, private sector, Western governments as creditors, and multilateral development as cre- creditors, all the creditors facing some internal constraint for you know variety of the reasons. And so on the, on the Chinese side, you know, one of the sort of idio- idiosyncratic feature that we see is that uh, they are very reluctant to take a outright cut in the principal amount. However, they are relatively flexible uh, in extending the law. Now, objective economic analysis will say there always exists a way to adjust the uh, maturity structure of the loan in such a way that give you the same present value as a outright cut in the principal. On the multilateral development bank side, for example, there are strong reluctance to take any uh, nominal cut whatever reason they uh, give, but there's some flexibility to add grant, you know, World Bank uh, and, and IMF in a way, uh, or offer uh, World Bank in particular and, and, and regional development banks offer grants all the time. So you can imagine like, some combination from uh, on the mod- MDB point of view, combination of a grant uh, and maybe extension belongs, uh, they normally will not involve, they take a cut, effectively the same thing as reducing the debt burden of the, of, of the that in the other countries. For Chinese, they're the same thing. If there's a combination of, you know, extension maturities and maybe uh, new inflows, they will serve the exact the same function. So therefore, why, you know, on surface, we see a lot of uh, obstacles, a lot of uh, uh, barriers to reach agreement. But I think if, you know, if we think about, um, if both sides allow for some flexibility, there's a scope for uh, some compromise uh, that will help that uh, in the other countries in simultaneously achieving a reduction in present value of the debt uh, and some uh, sort of uh, enabling environment that can attract uh, new flows uh, into the countries. Shangjin, let me just stay with this very quickly just to understand a little bit more of the background on the Chinese thinking on debt. You you said that they're reluctant to cancel the debt. As far as I know or have been following in the past few years, I can't think of any example where they actually canceled the debt. In Ecuador, they stretched it out. They restructured it. Same in Angola, in Ethiopia as well. They've canceled some of the zero interest loans, but those only account for about, you know, one to three percent of the total debt portfolio. So very, very small. We hear different things from people in Beijing as to why they are so reluctant to cancel debt, to follow the example of Paris Club creditors, for example. Uh, Some people say, it's just a, a Chinese cultural norm that you loan people money, they expect it back. And that is the expectation. In fact, the terms of the deals were made very clear when these countries negotiated contracts with the Chinese that these loans were not charity, they were going to be paid back. In fact, we talked to a BRI lawyer, he was on the show and he negotiated some of these loans. He said, listen, if you borrow money from the Chinese, you had better be prepared to pay it back. So there's a cultural aspect to it. Then we've talked to other people who have said that the systems within the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank were never designed to cancel debt. They actually have to implement internal reforms to make this happen. And part of the reluctance is that those internal reforms require a lot of stakeholder engagement. In fact, uh, the Finance for Development Lab recently held 
a conference and with a PBOC, People's Bank of China representative, and he even alluded to some of the domestic reforms that need to take place politically in order to accommodate some of the requests for debt cancellation. That is a complex process in a government as large as China's. Can you give us a little bit of insight into some of the resistance to the debt cancellation that has slowed the debt reconstruction process in countries like Zambia, Sri Lanka, and many others? Two things. Number one, there's a lot of truth to what you uh, said. Part of the Chinese banking sector reforms of of the last uh, uh, two or three decades was to impose much harder constraints on bank uh, lenders to, uh, that's Chinese way to manage soft lending, soft uh, uh, budget constraint problems. So even in the domestic uh, context, loan officers uh, take on extraordinary kind of uh, burden in making sure the loans don't, don't go sour. So that if, 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 you know, if uh, not just the, uh, banks, but we talk about individual officers of a bank that approve uh, loans. If, if a loan goes uh, bad, uh, there's sort of a bad, bad mark uh, that, that go with the loan officer, even if he or she changes uh, employers. So the reason there's this such a feature in uh, Chinese banking uh, system now is some time ago, there were a lot of uh, bad debt. The Chinese banks collectively in the 1990s were uh, near uh, technical uh, default. So a major reforms of the banking sector was to impose much uh, harder budget constraints on the banks as a whole uh, and on individual uh, loan officers' responsibility. So this, this feature applies to Exim Bank and uh, China Development Bank as well. So their loans have a, you know, has a different components, but very big chunk of this are made same kind of a commercial basis in their mind as are subject to the same kind of disciplines uh, as domestic loans. So that uh, explains part of their uh, strong reluctance to nominal haircut at the same time. So that's one point. At the same time, I said earlier that they, they, they have relative greater flexibility in rescheduling that. And it is useful to uh, notice that from a present present value point of view, there's some equivalence for two. So, so uh, we perhaps can make better use of their relative flexibility in extending uh, uh, schedules. I would also note that it's not the case that China never cancels that. There are many waves of Chinese cancellation of debt, especially debt owned to China by African countries by this. But this typically, this decision typically have to take, be taken at much higher political level. Individual loan officers and maybe individual banks are extremely uh, averse to taking those because they could be often uh, uh, responsible, li- liable for uh, debt going bad. But at the, at the political level, you know, I think uh, every time uh, there's a uh, when there's a China uh, Africa uh, leadership uh, summit, there generally uh, is a you know, wave of debt cancellation, debt uh, reduction. So I think this is still possible, but these are decisions that need to be taken at the level above uh, individual banks, certainly above individual officers. Ishak, another of the realities that is complicating the debt uh, renegotiation process at the moment is the much increased role of private sector lending in the current debt crisis. And and the private sector and bondholder actors have, have also you know, face some criticism for holding up these these renegotiation processes. Could you kind of clue us in a little bit about what are some of the complications on their side and like what is, you know, some of the thinking behind them kind of resisting debt renegotiation? You know, Kobus, we can talk about that, but really this is a drawn out process and in some ways we're far from getting to a negotiation with the private sector. Actually, some funds told me that, say, in the case of Zambia, they haven't been even mot- not notified of what has happened so far. I mean, just to take us back to, to the previous discussion, in the case of Zambia, uh, Exim Bank had raised several issues, right? And it's the majority in terms of the bilateral. So normally, you know, they're the co-chair of the committee and uh, uh, they, they, they have the, the right to ask questions. So... The first question was about the MDB uh, sharing the losses, and uh, we talked about that. But there is other issues as well, which we haven't discussed yet. One relates to the private sector. It's the treatment of domestic debt held by non-residents. And that's an issue in Ghana and in Sri Lanka as well. And uh, we're, we're not close to a resolution here either. Another is uh, they think that loans... I'm, I'm sorry, Ishak, c- could I stop you there? What does non-residence mean? Is that, that uh, If you could just explain that, because I think it may not be clear for our audience. 
Sure. I mean, first of all, domestic debt is very important in this debt crisis. It's perhaps half more or less of, of public debts in general. And that's a good thing that there is more domestic debt. And, you know, typically this could be treated differently uh, in the sense that, you know, one problem is the availability of foreign exchange. Uh, the government could deal with domestic debts uh, through through devaluations or through restructuring it. You know, it's, it's, it's all done over uh, national law, so it's easier. Now, increasingly, equity funds or, or other, other funds have bought domestic debts because they have very high interest rates, typically. Uh, so, 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 for example, take the case of Egypt. These bonds were offering 20% uh, more or less on average. So many f- funds have bought into them. And when Egypt got into crisis, they rushed all to the exit and you know, got reserves from the central bank and got out. This is hot money. Now, you know, similarly, in the case of Zambia, you know, Zambia tried to attract uh, foreign lenders into its domestic market when it started running into difficulties. And, and they bought and, you know, they, they issued bonds at high rates that those bought. And so the question now is how you treat them. Normally, you know, you could leave those uh, out of uh, the restructuring perimeter, but to the extent that they have access to foreign exchange, they are part of the calculated gap in the IMF program. And so, in a way, they become senior to the, the external debt that you're, you're haircutting. So, the Chinese ask to either brought the, bring them into the perimeter or not give them access to foreign exchange during the length of the program, so in effect have capital controls. Uh, But in reality, it's technically very difficult for the Zambians to know which of their bonds is held by a non-resident and which is held by a a national, and it may even be illegal to discriminate uh, between them. So so it's it's a complex issue, uh, but that is turning out to be an important issue in in most of the cases being discussed now, in in Ghana also and Egypt as well. Yeah, if I could add a point on this uh, same uh, question, China has a point and and it's useful for the global commodity to find a way to take that into account. So the the point is this, right? So many of the domestic debt may be issued in local currency, but the holders are not just, you know, domestic households or or firms or investors. It could include the pension funds, hedge funds, from other uh, countries, uh, overwhelmingly American and European hedge funds investors rather than Chinese uh, investors, Chinese in- individual investors or funds uh, will have trouble uh, investing directly abroad. So efficient, relatively easy way to enforce haircut is to have, to have a haircut all creditors, regardless of their uh, sources. Maybe you make exception for uh, IMF, World Bank, and other multilateral development banks, but for non-MDB uh, kind of credit- creditors, so one way to do this is to just have a uniform haircut uh, scheme, and they were actually easy to enforce. Because you know the problem uh, Isha talk about how to distinguish between certain particular private creditors from others would not be there if you have a uniform uh, haircut uh, scheme. Yeah, but who is going to enforce that? I mean, this has been the problem: is that we are now three years into this process of debt reconstruction in the pandemic era, and the system has failed miserably. I mean, the existing rules-based order that the United States and Europe speak so highly of is not living up to the challenge of debt reconstruction. And part of the problem is that everybody is skeptical or cynical or untrustworthy of the next guy. Indeed. I've brought this up before. I don't know if you've seen the movie Reservoir Dogs, where everybody's got a gun pointed at everybody else and, you know, everybody wants to shoot. And that is really what this feels like, whereas the private creditors feel that if you know, they have to take a haircut, but the Chinese don't, then their losses are going to be used to repay the Chinese. The Chinese think that the MDBs are getting off easy. The MDBs say, you know, the private creditors and the bilaterals are the problem. And then you've got the Americans and you've got the Chinese spitting at each other every third Thursday about how they're to blame and they're not to blame and whatnot. So we have this complete mess. And then, Ishak, you brought up this highly complex system that no one really knows who's actually owning the debt. That's a problem in Zambia today. We don't even know who it is. So this is a system that was built in the horse and buggy era, and now we're talking about hydrogen cars. <laughs> you know, where the, you know, it's just, so can you guys kind of talk to both 
about is the system actually capable of solving the problem as it's set up today? Ishak, let's start with you and then Shang Jin, I'd love to get your take on that. No, it's clearly the system is not working anymore. When it was mostly by club creditors and uh, MDBs and with the phone calls, you could arrange the scheduling, it worked. Now that you have non-Paris club, you have China, you have others, you have the private sector. It's a very complex field and you need rules. Rules need to be clear and written that uh, reduces your flexibility. But however, we're not in a period where you could have kind of a roundtable like the, the roundtables that are happening at a very high level over two days and decide on rules because of geopolitical differences and difficulties. And so and especially that I think China is not in a rush, because as Shang Jin explained, there are difficulties in absorbing losses domestically. And the Chinese have also realized that it's not a systemic crisis. So there are few countries that are in problem today. It, it may develop into a tsunami of debt, and it is already you know, becoming a development crisis because uh, countries being cut from the bond market are uh, you know, reducing their own expenditure. And so, so this is becoming a very difficult uh, situation for many countries. but So it's still being discussed on a case-by-case -case basis, and basically at this stage, poor Zambia is the victim of this, because this is where, you know, the difficulties are, this is where rules <laughs> are being written through negotiations. And I think the Chinese are not in a big hurry right now. It's more of a drawn-out process with many phases to come. It doesn't look good and the victims are the country. One number is perhaps we can keep in mind. For every dollar that Ida spends in poor countries today, we see a dollar coming out in debt repayment to bilaterals and to the market. And so Ida itself is becoming a victim of this debt crisis. Would it be able with such a poor aid effectiveness record right now to go back to the donors in, in a year and ask for a replenishment? If it's asked in addition to take debt reduction, you know, the reflows, another source of funding would come down. And finally, can it go to the market and borrow with all this uncertainty? So there are some big problems uh, coming if we don't find a solution, we don't find a better way for this system to work. And yet it's not happening. Ishak, just to emphasize the point that you just made about $1 in is $1 out, we got some new numbers from Nigeria from the debt management office that 96.3% of revenue in 2022 was spent on debt servicing. So basically, almost everything that the government brought in in taxation duties and tariffs went for debt servicing. Shang Jin, let's get your take on, can the system actually hold? Is the system working? Is it even capable? So first of all, the last number you quote there, a very big part of new revenue collection goes into debt servicing. It's a very strong illustration of the debt overhang problem. So, so the consequence of this is that investors and entrepreneurs are, and countries are very reluctant to invest to generate new output, uh, new revenue, because when you generate a new revenue, big part of it do not come back to you as returns, but go to creditors. And that's the problem. So if countries stop to invest and to produce, because the problem is getting worse and worse, people in those countries are, are suffering. That's why we need to address the debt overhang problem. Uh, number, one, number, number two, uh, indeed, uh, I think the mistrust among many creditor countries, uh, including between US and China, is important source of the uh, impasse that we are seeing uh, now. So in a way, that the dismiss some of the mistrust, in a way, is, uh, is an unnecessary consequence of a geopolitical tension uh, that's uh, quite uh, problematic. So, for example, on that issue, the uh, U.S. and many other countries think, you know, China is, is the largest bilateral creditor, is a source of the problems. If you go to talk to the Chinese creditors, banks, uh, and policymakers, you know, they add other elements to this. So, so one of the big ones we need to keep in mind, or they will say, uh, in understanding both the build up of the debt in the previous decade and the current crisis, one of the, you know, has this uh, U.S. policy component to this. That is, the U.S. very low, ultra low interest rate of previous decade incentivized many countries to build up debt and also incentivize the Chinese to move move away from holding their foreign assets in the form of low-yielding U.S. government debt towards uh, assets uh, elsewhere, including loans to uh, developing countries. And then the 
very rapid increase in U.S. interest rate in the last year and a half is one of the important contributing factors to the difficulty of servicing debt, difficulty of securing new loans that we are seeing right now, the problem that we are talking right now. This is not just true in the current wave of uh, a debt crisis. In fact, in previous multiple waves of debt crisis, the 90s, 80s, when uh, China was not involved as a creditor. You have the same in 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 the background. You have the see uh, you see the same kind of effect from the U.S. interest rate cycles. It is in times of low U.S. interest rate uh, cycles before the debt crisis. You see accumulation of debt, partly promoted by the low interest rate. And then when the U.S. interest rate increases, you see massive debt crisis. Not just solving debt crisis we see in developing countries in the previous few decades, but also debt crisis facing by exporting firms, financial crisis by uh, local banks and so on. It's not part of the solving debt crisis problem we talk about, but part of the general debt crisis problem we talk about. So that's kind of the background there as well. So, so I guess some of the source of mistrust on the Chinese side was to say, you know, that part of the issue needs to be recognized as uh, well. Now, in terms of solution, I'll go back to the point that a uniform haircut imposed on creditors is a solution that uh, presents the least enforcement problem because you don't need to a distinction between who are the lenders, right? So you know, an analogy will be like if you, if you are managing a store selling apples, if the apple sales scheme involves offering different prices to different buyers, you have to spend a lot of resources trying to make sure you know which buyer. Talk about do people pretend to be a different kind of buyers or not? That's very costly thing to do. Versus typically we ha- we charge single price of apple to or buys, and that actually is a relatively easy way to uh, enforce. I think there's an energy here in the debt service environment we are talking about here as well. I'd like to disagree with that, if I may, although <laughs> technically I agree with Shang Jin on everything, but I think we have apples and oranges here, and not just apples, because, I mean, we're talking about the poorer country debt problem, not the emerging market, and that's a completely different field than the emerging market in that you have heterogeneous actors offering loans with very different grant components. I mean, the World Bank with the International Development Assistant is not a normal lender. They are not maximizing profit. They lend even to countries that are bankrupt. When debt is high, instead of loans, they give grants, so they take losses, actually. That normal firm doesn't take losses. You know, the Paris Club lenders, we've calculated the grant elements of all those actors. The Paris Club, for IDA, it's uh, about 50%, the International Development Assistance. For the Paris Club, is about 40%. For China, lands at relatively low rates, 3 4%. So on average, the grant element is 20%. And the market lands at zero grant element. So actually, I've even heard Chinese officials saying that it would not be a fair treatment, comparability of treatment would not be fair if uh, the Chinese loans and the private sector are cut in the same proportion. So... There is a big issue about what does comparability of treatment mean for the poor countries. And one of the outcomes of the roundtable last week in Washington was actually to form a group that will have to think about comparability of treatment. And that they will have to meet uh, uh, in the next few weeks and explore in a deeper way. There are many ways to apply it. Uh, Shang Xin, you talked about a similar percentage haircut, then the question is, is it on face value or is it on the present value of the debt? And now there's a third proposal, which is to try to bring down the new exchange debt to the same grant element for all the existing actors, which means that the private sector will actually take a bigger cut than the Chinese bilaterals, more or less the same as the Chinese private. And AIDA, the International Development Assistant, may take a haircut, but even smaller, and be allowed to provide that in the form of future flow. So it's getting more complex than applying the same treatment to everyone. Ishak, in, in addition, another complexity that's also coming up is this big shift in the World Bank's mission, you know, from poverty alleviation, its traditional mission towards climate. So I was wondering what the implications of that shift is for the work of the World Bank going into the future. Well, can I just say one sentence about Ishak's previous climate? I think that there's actually more agreement than disagreement there. Uh, first of all, separating NDB as a creditor from others is relatively easy to do. But precisely because MDBs also offer grants, that actually makes, you know, in other words, NDBs routinely 
offer concessions. You know, just incorporate that into the daily structuring negotiation. If that helps move negotiation along, is something that's、uh, desirable to consider in terms of having haircut on what. Of course, I, I will advocate having a haircut present value of the debt because that's what's important for the indebted the,、uh, countries. On climate change, you know, climate change clearly is an important goal for the whole world, and it's also a goal that carries strong externalities. Therefore, it's one of those issues that naturally call for global collaboration. So, for some of the indebted countries, if you know promoting climate change friendly policy is、uh, globally desirable, if there's a way to incorporate the two,、uh, that's also、uh, helpful. So, for example, in terms of a new financing flow into those、uh, countries, to the extent the、uh, uh, new flows can be made to be connected to、uh, climate friendly. Goes, I think that's desirable uh, uh, as well.、Uh, you know, for example, the Chinese、uh, says they want to promote more new green finance. They're looking for new tools. They want to increase the size of this. So why not work with that? that? I think that's uh, uh, you know things that's、uh, good for the global gold. I think、uh, you know that's kind of things that、uh, we should be、uh, open to collaboration. Let me just ask you a quick question on this issue of the private creditors, because there's been a lot of attention on the Chinese. In many cases, the Chinese are minority stakeholders, even in places like Zambia, where they're the largest bilateral creditor. But when measured against the total amount of debt, they're comparatively small. The private creditors in places like Zambia, Ghana, and Sri Lanka and elsewhere are significantly more. What we've heard from The financial services industry, though, is that it's not quite so simple for them to simply cancel debt. So, just like the Chinese have their internal constraints, the fiduciary laws make it very, very difficult for a hedge fund, a pension fund, a mutual fund, any kind of these funds to say, "Okay, we're just going to give up, you know, five percent and throw it away." It's not that simple. And so they have complained that the laws in UK and in New York that govern a lot of these funds. Have not loosened in the three or four years to make it easier for them to negotiate. So even if they wanted to cancel, they can't always do it. Can you give us some insights on that,、uh, Shangjin? Yes. So、uh, that's correct. You know, the, of course, all creditors need to realize if that restructuring does not take place, not only their countries suffer, creditors collectively also suffer. So therefore, it is in everyone's interest to find a productive solution. So in other words, even if you have Uh, you know, Western uh, hedge uh, funds. It's not like resisting、uh, restructuring ultimately means you get everything. You gain only if other creditors make concessions. You don't. That's kind of the game we worry about. So globally, we want to avoid creditors play that kind of a game and get them to realize that、uh, just relying on other creditors to take credit、uh, to take、uh, a loss. Might very well lead to everyone suffering even greater to loss. So, so that's kind of the the outcome we want to avoid. So therefore, I think、uh, you know having some、uh, collective equal co sacrifice essentially is essentially is the way to go. All、uh, debt holders can、uh, you know you, you, this is a process that that to be、uh, need to be、uh, managed. If the debt contract contains a collective、uh, action and clause, then they make it easier to. Uh, arrange that is that、uh, you don't have you don't need every single creditor to agree. If a majority of the creditors agree in dollar amount of the share of total debt agree, that can be imposed on all creditors. You find a solution. If the heter、uh, if the creditors are more heterogeneous,、uh, some of the creditors don't have those kind of collective action、uh, calls. They will be problematic. But then you need、uh, you know some uh, uh, international process that essentially will impose those kind of obligations on all creditors. The problem we are facing now is that that's not the kind of、uh, negotiation we are having. So one of the suspicion、uh, by some lenders and、uh, perhaps、uh, research as well is that private creditors from U.S. and Europe are politically extremely powerful. They are lobbying their parliaments, their government to say to resist this because they are politically very powerful. They are willing to certainly sacrifice Chinese interest, but often. Taxpayers' interest of their own countries to protect themselves. Then, part you know,、uh, suspicion by some is that you know politicians in Western countries, in, in a way, are more beholden to the interests of, of the private creditors than perhaps globally desirable. So, in that sense, I think、uh, we shouldn't exclude anyone. Maybe MDB is exception. I'm, I see a much stronger case to make exemptions for multilateral development banks. 
uh, than for uh, other creditors, right? So, I mean, like, for example, one of the obstacles we see in terms of Chinese creditors is that the Chinese sometimes say some of their creditors, China development banks, for example, have been operating as a, despite the name, have been operating like a commercial bank, both within China financing as well as international financing. So in that sense, the Chinese insist they should be treated as uh, like other private sector creditors. Of course, people in the West says, no, no, since you are called development bank, you should be, uh, your lending should be considered uh, as a sovereign thing. So that's kind of, you know, one, one kind of an impasse we are seeing. Suppose we have a uniform haircut scheme, then this discussion will go away, right? So that's why I'm thinking, I'm advocating a equal haircut solution to this problem. You know, if I could add something, I mean, the politics are very important here, but I don't really see a willingness of Western government to protect the hedge funds at this stage. I'm not even sure that the, the hedge fund would lobby for a special treatment in poor countries because they need to defend their reputation to be on solid grounds when the big cases come, the emerging markets. And, and potentially, this is where the crisis would lead us at that stage. And this is where the big bucks are. I mean, uh, you know, the big hedge fund have a billion dollar in, in Zambia or in Ghana, and I don't think they're going to really put all their political capital in protecting this. And one thing we need to note is that, and like the case of big bilaterals such as China, the IMF has strong sticks to make the private sector you know, respect the rules. And this is the lending into arrears policy that they have since the 2000s. And so the IMF could actually disburse a program while the country does not pay the private sector until the private uh, agree to a deal with a comparability of treatment with what was already agreed with, with the public sector. So, of course, there is always a fear of vulture fund and, uh, you know, complexities arising there uh, because, as Zhang Jin said, all the bonds don't have comparability of treatment and there are other complexities with collateral, for example. But uh, broadly speaking, the, when we get there, dealing with the private sector may end up being much simpler than dealing with having China learn how to cooperate with the rest of the international community. On that, continuing that line, you know, as you're looking at this entire system, and as you pointed out, Ishak, that uh, in, in a lot of ways, the system is currently not working very well. Are you seeing kind of new solutions or new like paths forward being explored at this moment of crisis? Like, uh, is, is there kind of like interesting kind of thought leadership around like new ways of dealing with this issue, particularly considering that poor countries then, you know, faces double developmental impact of both a development gap and a climate impact. All of them are clearly going to need more money in order to deal with these kind of like twin challenges. Are there ways emerging where they where it, it will be a less fraught process going forward? I don't think so. I think we'll have to go through this process until new rules are written. Uh, you know, ideally, as I said, there will be a big meeting of minds of all the powerful actors and uh, new rules would be devised. But unfortunately, I think it will be a more drawn out process. And the problem is, you know, we need to move to a new phase where we talk about, you know, bringing the poorer countries into adapting to climate change, developing a new growth strategy that's adapted to saving the earth and figure out what green growth is and moving from billions to trillions. So there's a whole narrative again around the climate and the debt problem is blocking that move. And, you know, all we're talking about now the, where the architecture is moving is on the scaling up of resources for IBRD at this stage. And even that discussion is about how to increase the leverage because no one is willing to increase the, the capital uh, of these institutions right now. So there is a, there is a bit of a, of a stock, and you could feel it last week in Washington at the spring meeting. I was uh, in a meeting with uh, finance ministers from Africa, and they're saying, you know, the house is burning and we're talking about other things, about Ukraine, about uh, IBRD, about medium and long term green growth. And we're not dealing with our problems. And so there's a large discontent about the architecture not working, about the need for Africa in particular to have much more voice uh, in international 
groups such as the G20 and the board of the MDBs so that its own problems are taken into consideration in the remaking of this architecture, which is just not serving its purpose anymore. Shangjin, let's give you the last word about this new thinking. If it's there, if it's not there, what's your thoughts? Well, let's keep in mind, you know, the goal of a debt restructuring is to help this indebted country be able to have access to new financing so they have both incentive and the means to invest for development. Thinking from this perspective, I think there are ways that, uh, uh, ways to move this forward. We need to keep working very hard in finding a uh, solution to the existing stock debt problems. We can think about ways to also getting new financing flow into productive sector of those those countries. For example, one of the things that I would advocate is various kind of reforms so that the countries can be more attractive destination for foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment, in contrast to debt financing, has a few properties. One is it is a new investment; it goes to the productive sectors, and two. It doesn't have the problem of, uh, you know, if something does not work out, this becomes a debt problem for the recipient countries because FDI comes in with a more desirable risk sharing properties. If the FDI project does not work out, the, the investor automatically take a hit together with, of course, the recipient, uh, with recipient countries. So one of the problems we see in many indebted countries is in their overall external liability structure, there's way too much debt and not enough foreign direct investment or not enough other form of uh, financing that has a better risk-sharing property. So one of the things, that, therefore, international community can work on and those countries can work on through their policy reforms is to improve the environment so that those places become a much more attractive destinations for foreign direct investment. Shang Jinwei is the N.T. Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy at Columbia University and also a professor of finance and economics at the Columbia Business School and the School of International and Public Affairs. He's also the former chief economist at the Asian Development Bank. Shang Jin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Also, Ishak Diwan is the research director of the Finance for Development Lab at the Paris School of Economics. Ishak, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate both of you gentlemen for taking times out of your busy schedule to help us understand the complexities of what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kobus, let's step back a little bit now and reflect on the week of conversations that we've had with Shang Jin, with Ishak, and then earlier this week with Kevin Gallagher. I have to admit, I came into this week with these shows and these interviews thinking that I was going to get good news, thinking that I heard all this word of progress at the spring meetings, that there was a breakthrough that was happening, that there was movement on the Zambia debt issue. Now, after all these conversations that we've had, I don't think so. I, in fact, I think it, in some ways it may be worse because there's a veneer of progress without any substance behind it. A couple interesting keynotes here. Number one, in Sri Lanka, the Paris creditors moved on without the Chinese. They started the reconstruction process and they didn't invite the Chinese and they said, forget it. And then right after the spring meetings were over, Zambia's finance minister went back on television again saying, I'm appealing for immediate action. And the point that Shang Jin made, which was very, very interesting, that the Chinese do not see this as a systemic issue. That is, it's not going to affect the entire world at the same time. Well, obviously, for Zambia, it's a systemic issue, but not for the rest of the world. So they're comfortable dragging their feet on this and drawing out the process. Zambia, of course, is collateral damage. And it's not only the Chinese, but they're certainly a culprit in all of this. Then... <laughs> We're no better today than we were six months ago, and that sucked six months ago. So I don't know what to say after this week. What's your takeaway from this week? One of the big realizations that came to me in, in, in these conversations is that we really at a moment where entire systems have to be rejiggered, you know, even as we're facing a, a kind of a growing emergency like a lot of the pathways towards the future are still being built. So you get this feeling that we're trying to rush across the bridge, but that we're still building the bridge at the same time. And this is very, very challenging for countries where a growing climate crisis and a, a massive development gap on top of 
a youth bulge is making for very unstable conditions. You know, so like the impact of on the ground kind of climate disruption is already so big and it's going to be so much bigger over the next decade that it, it hazards you know, running away with us without without us being able to set up new systems that could actually deal with some of these challenges. And so the, that kind of feeling of like, oh, we, we kind of like making up the system as we're moving forward is a bit unsettling. I know, but we hear a lot in the development community about this making up new systems. But let's be honest. The United States does not want to concede any of its authority and power over the system. The Europeans don't want to give up any of theirs. The Chinese want more for them. How is that going to be done in this current political climate? I mean, I just don't see that happening. Under the best of circumstances, this kind of reform would be difficult to do. In the current environment where nobody seems to like each other, how do you get that done? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I think we got to be realistic about the politics today. I mean, they literally hate each other, okay? They can't even be in the same room together with one another without glaring at the other. So how are we going to, how, if the U.S. and China can't actually come to some kind of compromise on this, then there's no possibility of substantive reform. And that explains in part why we've had three years of failed debt restructuring. Yeah, I mean, what I what I fear is that is that as you know, as people say, it's not a systemic crisis now. It could very much be a systemic crisis a few years down the line. My fear is that we're going to, that everyone's going to be waiting around until that happens. You know, hopefully that won't be the situation. I think you know, I think that one does have to acknowledge though that that the Europeans, the Americans, and the Chinese do have they're not immune to the system. They're not they're not completely isolated from the system. And one of one of the things that that where they are on the hook for is their global leadership. Is you know kind of is their claim on global leadership. You know, if they can't make this work, then their claim on global leadership doesn't go away. You know, they're very powerful countries and you know, but at the same time it does get tarnished. And at a moment when both the Chinese and the Americans, you know, even though they're so different, they're quite similar in other in, in some respects. One being that they both quite bo kind of like invested in the idea of a bipolar future system. You know, the, like both speaking to people in Beijing and speaking to people in Washington, they are convinced that this is where we're heading. It's like, you know, kind of a, a China block and a, a US-led Western block. Obviously, in, you know, kind of in, seen from the global south, a lot of, a lot of people have been pointing out that global south audiences tend to think more of multipolar systems. But what, what a multipolar, there's different kinds of multipolar systems. And one option is a much more fragmented, much more chaotic multipolar system in which, you know, kind of global, the global leadership of both the United States and China come into question simply because the, the global system itself becomes so chaotic. So obviously that is a kind of a nightmare scenario that everyone wants to avoid. Um, and, but I think that one of the big challenges is that I think different people have different ideas of how far away we are from that level of chaos. You know, if you're looking at a country like Sudan, that chaos is pretty close. So the, that, I think, is a big thing. I think from the African perspective, that chaos is a lot closer than it looked from Washington or Beijing. Yeah, let me put another scenario out there. And it's a scenario that the status quo today just keeps going on and on and on. And if Zambia falls off the map, okay. Okay, it's not going to affect the politics in, in Beijing or Washington because clearly neither one of them cares very much. I mean, when Kamala Harris goes there and, you know, when she was going there, she was just talking up all the great things that the United States is doing, how wonderful it is. And then, you know, lots of questions about how bad the Chinese are. And then the Chinese kind of roll in. And they say, we're not to blame. Everything's great. Meanwhile, everybody in the Zambian government is saying we're being flushed down the toilet. And there's no price to be paid for that. Sure, maybe one day that might be a systemic threat that impacts Joe Biden's presidency, but that's not going to happen anytime soon, probably. So they seem very comfortable, by the way, at just letting this go. And so there's another scenario here where this just muddles on for the next two or three years. And if tens of millions of people starve or are malnutritioned or fall out of work because of a crashing currency, high inflation and just terrible economic fundamentals, you know, OK. No, there's definitely I mean, you know, there's an indifference to the suffering of the global south that's really entrenched, you know, kind of in the global system. And that's true. But 
you know so so sure like if if we if we're talking about two years three years then that i th- I, I think i think that is a, a sadly realistic kind of view but what you know kind of once we start talking about slightly longer time frames we're talking about a lot more chaos and the thing is these economies don't exist on their own right kind of like the u.s economy as kind of strong and independent as the u.s is like they're dependent like revenue flows from the rest of the world to the united states it flows from the rest of the world to china and that's what the economies depend on the more chaos there is in the global system the less that happens the more the the international footprint of their multinationals that are completely crucial to their economies are starting to be affected and of course they have thick buffers both of them they can absorb a lot of these shocks without necessarily feeling it but there's a limit to that there's a limit to how much business you know kind of mining companies can do you know once countries start going past a certain tipping point of chaos and that tipping point of chaos is a lot closer than i think a lot of people seem to realize and climate is making that a lot is, is 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 making that timeline a lot shorter. So you know, I agree with you. Like like these people don't care. I think a lot of them, but they're going to be made to care at some stage. But by then, it's going to be much too late for everyone. Well, Ishak made it pretty clear that even at this late stage in the crisis, the debt crisis that's affecting so many countries, and I can totally see what he was saying. People eating their canapes and their fancy kind of dishes in, uh, in, in Washington at the IMF in, in spring, uh, at the spring meetings, they were talking about everything else other than that crisis. And the African delegations were saying, wait, what? No, no, focus, people. We are about to fall into the abyss, and you're talking about you know all these things that aren't relevant to us. So... We've talked about this before on a number of occasions. I think that the African delegations have got to change their tact here because they can't, they got to be, they got to be, you know, what what John Lewis in the United States, you know, got into, I think he said it was good trouble. They've got to start raising that cost. I agree. And making it really well known because this whole being polite and just not calling people out, it's not working. Yeah. Okay. It's time to be rude. It's time to be rude. It's time to get into good trouble because whatever they're doing right now is not working. Trying to make everybody happy is not working. Now, maybe they say if we alienate one of the big powers or one of the big constituencies, that's even worse for us. Okay, maybe, but it can't be any worse than what it is now because nothing's happening now. And again, I'm oversimplifying it. Nothing is happening. I'm putting up my air quotes. Sure, there's lots of things happening behind the scene, but still... Remember, the Ghanaians were talking about debt reconstruction by the end of March. I thought they were just completely delusional on that, given what we've seen in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. You know, maybe it's because the Chinese aren't huge stakeholders in in Ghana, but still the Chinese need to get on board with everybody in Ghana in order to have that IMF package signed off. So they're still a big player, even though they're a relatively small share or part of the debt. But something is going to break. Either the economies are going to break that are wilting under the debt, Zambia is going to go first, or the system is breaking down. And here's another key part, and I know you're going to agree with me on this. We hear ad nauseum from U.S. stakeholders about the importance of the international system, the rules-based order. And I think we are at a breaking point right now that this is a key test for the global south to look up at the rules-based order and say, does it work for us? And the credibility of the United States to be able to say we ought to we want to preserve this rules based order against tyrannical rule from the Chinese who are trying to undermine this rule based order, and this is one of the interesting things that the Egyptians just this week leaned into the Chinese for debt relief because they're turning their backs on some of the debt reconstruction efforts from the West. The Tunisians are doing the same. We're hearing more and more of these countries saying this rules based order that you speak of isn't working for us. And if this debt process collapses, as it probably will, to me, that's going to be a massive blow to the credibility of the prevailing system and ultimately to the credibility of the United States that wants to preserve a system that doesn't work. And that will play into the Chinese favor. I think that's going to play into the Chinese hands. The Chinese are going to say, see, you see this system that they talk of so highly? What did it do for you? Never mind that the Chinese helped to contribute to the demise of it, too. Okay, fair enough. But that gets lost in the conversation. 
But the thing is, there's another kind of aspect to this, which I think I think people kind of like don't see, which is that you know, like we've come kind of through a long pro, a long kind of era of stability, right? Kind of like different kinds of stability, including including kind of like security provision by the U.S., including you know all of this this kind of cheap labor and big markets provision to you know from China, and these kind of like long quiet periods have benefited you know, certain powers in the world, for example, Europe, right? Kind of Europe has, has massively benefited from both those trends. Europe has also benefited from a third big trend, which is a relatively quiescent Africa, right? A kind of an Africa who doesn't make trouble, except for itself, frequently. Africa is 1.4 billion people. Africa has a lot of potential for chaos. A lot. <laughs> Once things really kind of go off the rails in Africa, there's a big potential for massive chaos, and that chaos will be hitting Europe first. You know, let's see how that goes, but it doesn't look good. So I closed this week of conversations about the debt issue seemingly as depressed as you do. I would be very skeptical of any of the pronouncements of breakthroughs. Uh, the folks at DevEx, I think, ran, and that's an online news source, ran what I thought was an irresponsible video interview with an IMF official who talked about a big breakthrough with the Chinese, but then didn't provide any specifics as to what that breakthrough was. And to me, it's just like, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> and again, there's a lot of hype around this. And people in Washington are focusing a lot on climate change and not necessarily on the issues that the finance ministries in Africa want to focus on. So that's coming through loud and clear. Anyway, let's leave the conversation there. I mean, these are tough issues. There's no doubt. These debt issues, though, are not something you can pop in and pop out and really understand. You really have to get the day-by-day, -day, the minutia, and all the little details of it to understand how it's unfolding. It's very, very complicated. There are so many actors. This is the kind of work that Cobus and the team at the China Global South Project are doing every day in our daily news digest, in our podcast, in French, English, and Arabic. We need your support to do this independent journalism. We are a nonprofit organization with journalists and editors in the Global South. If you would like to support the work that we do, we would appreciate joining us at chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. You can try out our service for 30 days for free. If you don't like it, of course, you don't have to pay, but we hope that you will like it and find it as valuable and useful as folks in Washington, at universities. Uh, you know, we serve about 25 governments around the world. We have a number of key universities who are subscribers to us. Think tanks, many of the hedge funds who are invested in Africa subscribe to us. So a lot of the key folks who are making decisions about this follow the work that we're doing, and we hope that you will do so as well. Let's leave the conversation there. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrikchine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. <laughs>